Dave's Bigfoot Show. Local people sharing their local, unexplained encounters with Bigfoot. Now, it's nice to see um, uh, as many women in the audience because there's only uh, one, uh, the one I read, and then there's only one other uh, woman that is going to be a, a guest tonight. She'll be the very last speaker. You'll want to stay to the very last speaker because it would be your worst nightmare, and her story is about a minute long. So uh, hang on for that one. Because I was going to actually say that women don't believe in Bigfoot. I was talking to a group of women uh, here about a week ago, and they said, Dave, what is Bigfoot? Yeah, it's right there. Uh, yeah, just hook him up. What is this Bigfoot day? And I explained, well, it's three, it's, uh, three hours of local people sharing local experiences about the creature known as Bigfoot. And they all looking at me going, well, who would come to that? <laughs> well, a lot of, and there's a lot of women here, so thanks for coming. Doug, come on up here. Doug Wilson, local people sharing a very unique, interesting uh, experience. Yeah, and hold that microphone, just touch your chin with it. And uh, uh, that's how it works. So we're talking... And actually, the idea of sitting here came from Doug Wilson, because we're sitting there over the back of his truck talking about just a little teeny thing, but it was so interesting that the whole idea uh, came from there. So, Doug, were you ever a young boy coming out of uh, high school or just messing around, or were you just always 50? Well, I'm gonna, I'm gonna, gonna have, have to, to get, get Dave, Dave back, back for this. Yeah, I kind of conned him. T tell us about it. And again, it's a it's a little short thing, but it's pretty significant. Go ahead. Um. Well, the experience I had, I don't. We never did really decide what we saw, but uh, we were uh, uh, three of us in a pickup, and we were going up Powder Mountain Road one night and it was we were getting excited about the deer hunt so we had a spotlight up on the mountain and we were just looking for deer and seeing what we could see and part way up the mountain uh, we could see uh, what caught our attention was uh, uh, some eyes some eyes glowing up on the hillside and uh, we stopped the truck and had the spotlight up there and uh, it looked like a person sitting on the side of the hill uh, with their arms over their knees just staring down at us but there was no you know, the, there's no light colored clothing or anything, anything. It was all dark, and we could just see those eyes looking at us. And uh, we just kind of got out of there, and uh, we still never talk about that very much to this day. But uh, that's just a little experience that you see something you don't you don't know what to think about it. But anyway, a little bit out of the ordinary. Well now, uh, so when he's telling me this story, and for those seasoned Bigfooters, what's the first thing that you would say when he said these two eyes uh, glowed or reflected back on us and that's what caught our attention? What would you say? What color were they? Well, no, you wouldn't say that. Uh, give me a more seasoned Bigfooter. <laughs> Human eyes don't reflect. That's what you would say. So, for sure, it's not a guy sitting up there. They my well, no, that was, uh, that was the sunglasses that they were wearing. The next thing, Doug took me up there, and we, we sat on the side of the hill and looked up, and it's about 125 yards away. And you realize, you know what? If I stood up there and was sitting on my haunches, 
it would be really hard to see me. And uh, I, I just think that idea is uh, quite interesting. And I, I, I want to uh, thank Doug for inspiring the Bigfoot Dave's Bigfoot show. Let's give him a big hand. And there he is. Good. And we've got uh, Bob, where'd you go here? We're right here. Let's come on up here, Bob Taylor, and we're going to get you plugged in. Give him a little plug for uh, uh, Buffalo Tire out there at the intersection of 1900 West and Riverdale Road. You go out there and he'll take care of you. And it's got a real cool uh, waiting room there. It looks like a hunting lodge. You go in and you uh, realize that... Uh, this guy has been around, he's seen animals, he knows animals. That's not a problem. Thanks for coming. Good. And take that one and just hold it right under your lip. Yeah, okay. just touch it. There you go. Now, uh, uh, Bob, we wanted to talk about a couple of things. First, talk to us. We're going to first talk to you, how you tell us about Monte Cristo, and then the next one about the National Forest, Lolo National Forest. Okay. Um. It was uh, early to mid-80s. Uh, Alan Wetton and Dan Casper and my brother-in-law Steve Bingham were going archery hunting. Uh, we got on the Ant Flat Road and we headed towards Hardware Ranch. I'd never hunted up there. It was a place, unfortunately for me, in telling this story, this place was called Scare Canyon. Many of you know where that's at. It's crossed, it's west of Sheep Creek. and. Uh, I'd never been in this area before. I went up there because Alan knew someone that had some property in there. So we, we proceeded up there in the morning. And uh, I don't hunt with other people. I, there was four of us indeed, but I hunt alone. And uh, I'm not a real avid archery hunter, but I felt comfortable doing what I was doing. So anyway, wherever we parked on this dirt road, I headed straight west. And it was kind of a sagebrush flat for probably 250, 300 yards. There was a five-strand barbed wire fence with red T posts. Many of you maybe know where that's at. <laughs> but anyway, I went across the, across the barbed wire fence, came to a ravine. Of course, I didn't go down in there because I was hunting. So I snuck around the edge of that and went on the west side of that and headed straight west and hunted over there most of the day. It was getting late in the day, and that evening on my way back, uh, maybe uh, 45 minutes before dark, I was trying to get back to that ravine from the west side, and once I got there, I knew that I could find my way back to the vehicle. Well, I, on the west side of the ravine, it was heavily timbered, and there was chaparral brush, and uh, as I waded my way through the chaparral brush, found the ravine, and I was looking across the ravine, which was probably 75, 80 yards at the most across, but it was fairly deep. And there was a little stream in the bottom, a lot of deadfall. And as I was looking across there, I was, of course, searching for the barbed wire fence. And I could see it in the distance at about 100 yards from where I was at. And uh, anyway, out of my peripheral vision, I caught something coming out of the bottom, running or just walking up a trail of sorts up to the top of this flat. And, of course, my mind is, uh, and like I told Dave early on, I've, I've spent a lot of time in the hills, and um, this is quite an experience for me because I try to determine in my mind what it is I was looking at. You know, is it a bear? Is it a moose? My, you know, what is it? And um, anyway, this thing walked up to the top of the, on the other side, on the sagebrush side of this ravine, and uh, I watched it walk up the whole way it stopped facing what I assumed because I could not see ears or eyes or, or a mouth, but it was assumed to be looking away from me. It stood there for a few minutes and it turned to its left and looked right in my direction, I'm assuming. And then he turned all the way around and took off about 10 steps, stopped, looked over his right shoulder again, and I'm still trying to figure out what it was I was looking at. And um, anyway, at that point in time, he took off running like 
you know, I, I like the comment that that one woman said that it was very graceful and mo nearly slow motion it appeared. But anyway, trying to figure out in my mind what it was I was seeing, I was waiting for him to hit that fence because when he hit the fence, I knew that he was either going to leap over it or he's going to stop and throw one leg over it or do whatever he did. But he never broke stride. There was no difference in his stride at all. He went across that five-strand barbed wire fence in his gait and uh, just ran straight east away from me, 200 yards or so, and went over the hill and to the left, and I could see the top of his head going down through the trees as he, as he disappeared. But anyway, um, no. and like I say, it's, it's undeniable to me. I saw what I saw. I can't define it. All I can say is, is that I've spent a lot of time in the mountains, and I've never seen anything like it in my life, and uh, I don't know. No, uh, I thought it was interesting. When it turned, it had to turn its whole body? Yes, it turned its whole body to the left and stared at me and then proceeded to make a, you know, go all the way around and then took a couple of steps, turned and looked back over his right shoulder and then took off. Uh, because everybody uh, talks about how heavy and thick uh, in the upper body they are, that it, would, that it, it nearly has to go like this. Right. You know, it can't just turn around like you and I could. Yeah, he wasn't turning around like an owl. He was turning, turning his yeah. whole body. But the thing I remember most, I spent some time in the military, and I remember what it looked like following a deuce and a half on a dirt road, and the canvas is untied. That's what his hair appeared to me. That's what, you know, in my mind, that's how I would describe it. And it was a chestnut color. But uh, I can still see the hair on that thing's back rolling as he ran away from me. And... and uh, uh, could you tell any uh, uh, difference in color from the, from the hair? Was it, uh, and it, maybe because of light you wouldn't be able to, but it, was there any dis different color down his back? Or sometimes they'll say there's a lighter along the shoulders or it's darker or even white down their back. Uh, there was different coloration on his back. I think in the, like in the middle of the shoulder blades was a little darker, a little lighter down. Uh, under his underarms, things like that, but it blended in pretty well. There wasn't a drastic different in color, but uh, I'll never forget the way it looked as it ran away. Yeah, that kind of spooked you. Tell us about the uh, Lolo National Forest uh, experience. Okay, at, um, we've hunted bear up in Montana for 35 years, um, and we hunt at a place called Radio Creek. And we go there because there's no people over there, and there's two roads that parallel each other. The roads have no names. They're just numbered. And, but these two roads parallel each other. And uh, anyway, I dropped my brother-in-law off at the bottom gate. I drove up to the top gate. We both had watches. We said, okay, set it for an hour. It's getting late. You walk an hour, get back. Uh, after an hour walk, you turn around and come back. I'm sure a lot of you hunters have done that. But... It was drizzly rain, and uh, I took the upper road, parked my truck up there, and I proceeded back on the road. I uh, walked for about 45 minutes and hit the snow line. Well, in the snow, I saw some tracks at about 20 feet away, and I walked up to them, and, you know, because I always check them out of the deer tracks, moose track, elk, deer, what is it? Anyway, I walked up there, and uh, I saw it was about 18 inches of snow, and this track was impressed in the snow and pushed down nearly to the dirt. It was about an inch left. It had melted out, true, but it was close enough to the dirt that it left a brown silhouette of this foot. And I could see distinct toes, it was five toes, and off to my right, there was a, a wash, a deep wash, or whatever you want to call them, I don't know, they're full of timber and deadfall and everything, very narrow wash. And that, whatever it was, came right up out of there and got up on the road as if he just got up there and looked around. Did like a 360 and turned around and went right back down in there again. And the funny thing about this story was, is in the whole time, this was after I saw what I saw up at uh, Scare Canyon, Sheep Creek area. But, uh, of course, I was a little ahead of my brother-in-law, so, but it was raining, so, and I didn't want to walk in the snow, so I, I went back, had no camera, I had no video camera, I had nothing. But I went back to the truck and drove down and sat at the gate waiting for my brother-in-law to come back to the truck. And uh, he, he came in. I was eating a sandwich. He came in, sat down by me, never said anything. And I just said, Steve, you're not going to believe what I saw up there on that upper road. And he says, 
<laughs> was it about that long? And I says, yeah, it was. And he says, they're all over down in the mud on the lower road. And I says, you're kidding me, you know. And anyway, and he says, and he, he shoots a 25 out 6 from the toe to the heel of the next step was two and a half lengths of his 25 out 6 Okay, so it's, it's just about dark now. And we get in the truck and we're jabbering about what we experienced. And we go around two or three corners going out of this canyon, Radio Creek. And a Forest Service guy is coming up in his service truck. And he flags us down. And he says, you guys hunting bear? He says, yeah. He says, have you had any luck? Yeah, we've got a few. And I says, what, what, are, you, what are you growing up behind these gates? Just kind of kidding with me. He says, what do you mean? And I says, you know, there's, there's tracks up there that are, that are human-like, and they're quite big. And the guy just says, oh, you know, got to be kidding me. I ain't going in there. And uh, so we went back to camp, talked to uh, uh, Polk Priest and my brother Jay and Bob Peterson and uh, Jay Archibald Christers and those guys that were with us on this trip about what we had seen. And my brother wanted to go back up that night, but it was raining. And I knew that, you know, whatever was there was going to be faded away or nearly gone so as it was the next morning my brother Pope Priest from Morgan or Mountain Green and my brother and Bob Peterson went back up to that same area got on the upper road the one I was on and the gate was open and as they went back in there the uh, Forest Service people were back in there covering everything up so you know here again I don't know I don't know what I saw. All I can say is, is that I've spent a lot of time out there, and I saw something that I cannot define. I was impressed by it. Don't talk a lot about it, but I'm more comfortable here because, yeah. you know, there's a lot of people here that believe in that kind of thing, and it's it's an it's a neat experience, and I'm, I'm glad I I was able to have that, and I appreciate the stories that have been told because. How do you like that? We saw what we saw. Yeah. Thank you very much. Bob, thank you very much. Okay, this is this is cracking me up <laughs> tonight. Well, I, I just feel like I've arrived to be able to sing here tonight for this event. <laughs> <laughs> Okay. I'm trying to think, Danielle. You're way farther past than singing for Bigfoot. No, I was. That was supposed to be a joke, and nobody laughed. They got it. Yeah, tell that again, and they'll really laugh. All right, I won't joke anymore. Did you want me to tell my Bigfoot story or no? Tell Just your Bigfoot sing. story. Shut up and sing. No, tell your Bigfoot story. Because <laughs> you know, it, what it's like everybody. Has, has a Bigfoot one. story. Well, we were over. Yeah. I, we were over at Texas Pride, and we were talking about this. And this is when it's kind of started to gel for you, right? To like have yeah. this event. And so, I was just telling him, um, when I was a little girl. <laughs> wow, that's so funny that I don't talk about it, and then I tell everybody. <laughs> um, when I was a little girl, my dad was in. He's here. Uh, he was in the Weaver County Mounted Sheriff's Posse. And we would go up to the high winters on these backcountry, um, what, just big camping trips. And we'd take the horses and we would camp and have a, we'd just have a blast. And in the day, the men would take their horses, they'd mount, mount up the horses, and they would go on rides all day and just um, explore. And the kids and the moms would stay back and we'd play and then the men would come back and we'd have dinner together and we'd sing around the campfire at night. Well, on one particular trip, which I will honestly never forget because the terror in a four-year-old child's mind, um, we, we were watching the guys leave and they all left and were doing their thing and us kids were playing and um, usually, like I said, the men were gone all day. A couple hours later, though, they came back and they were really quiet and the horses were a little frisky and, um, and, and the men wouldn't talk about why they came back early. And later, um, as we were kind of um, finishing up with our dinner and getting the campfire ready, um, my mom said, okay, they've got a story that I want you kids to hear. And 
that that thrilled me. So we we showed up at the campfire and they told us that they had seen Bigfoot that day and that the horses had freaked out and that there had been a sighting and um, I was pretty scared. I was just a little girl. And for all of these grown men to be saying, yeah, we, we saw something and we've never seen anything like it, um, that just always stuck with me. So there's my, my admittance that maybe he does exist. <laughs> And this is some kind of healing for you to be able to play yes. here at the Bigfoot Show. That was catharsis. Yeah. <laughs> okay, but with that said, um, I have this song that I wrote um, just a couple years ago, actually, about um, my fears, like about how our fears have power over us and they can paralyze us. As some people have said, when they get afraid, they, they get really um, paralyzed or speechless and... Um, I tend to get that way and sometimes after that happens I get kind of mad that I don't have the presence of mind to, um, to work through it and um, I was thinking of all these things that I'm afraid of and thinking, you know, I'm old enough now where I shouldn't be afraid of these things anymore. And so anyway, those were the thoughts that were going through my mind um, as I wrote this song and it's called No Such Thing, but that's not to take away from, from the stories of tonight. Shake this under the 
Jay Marker from North Ogden, Utah. Uh, in 1977, uh, my son says, let's go to the Uinas. Let's go up and do some fishing. Just like that. Okay. Right there. Uh, they wanted to do a little fishing before school started, and uh, my neighbor here, Larry Beeson, why I got with him, and I said, let's go up to the Uinas, do a little fishing. And so Larry... Uh, took his boys and another boy and they went up to the Cooper Lakes and I couldn't go the very day they did so I says I'll join you so the next day we came up and joined with Larry and and I think David was five years old at that time and uh, I had a six-year-old boy Danny and uh, I had another boy Brent and another son Neil that was there with us too mm -hmm. so uh, we get up to the Kubrant Lake. There's five lakes in the Kubrant Basin. The Kubrant uh, drains off into the Weber River, so we were right up in the top of the Weber River. And uh, Larry was camped there by the Kubrant Lake. And uh, we came in to where they were, and they says, well, the fishing's not good here. Uh, but we know that there's another lake. If we climb up over the ridge and walk to the north and drop down in there's another lake called Fish Lake up there. So that was the plan. We started climbing up the, up the, uh, up to the ridge there. It's about a 12,000 foot elevation. And we get up on the ridge there and uh, we're standing there looking around and we're actually looking down into the Bear River drainage now. And right at the back of the Bear River drainage, there's a little pond there and uh, we look in, in that pond, and by the pond there, and I see a creature down there, and at first I just kind of see black and white. And I said, Larry, I think I see an elk. And I started pointing it out, and Larry looks at it, and, and, and then this creature is standing there by this little pond, and uh, it wasn't an elk. It, it started walking away, <laughs> and uh, I think... I don't want to tell the whole story. I want okay. Larry no, to no, tell a yeah. bit too. And uh, David. Yeah, but before you switch, about what year again? This is 1977. And how about, far, about the 25th of August. And then how far were you looking down at that lake? Okay, we were looking approximately 700 yards, I figure. Okay. And we see this creature. And I'll let Larry tell you a little about it now. <clears throat> well, actually, what happened was uh, some of the boat, there was actually eight eight of us who seen it but there was two or three other boys how many was it Jay? two, two other two other boys were over rolling rocks and, uh, and unfortunately they, they never did see it but uh, uh, when when Jay says Larry there's an elk uh, I looked at it and it was walking on two legs and uh, one of my sons my oldest son he looked at me and he says dad what is it and I says I don't know and he says, is it Bigfoot? I says, yep, I think so. <laughs> and, <laughs> and so we, you know, we watched it. Uh, I don't know how long did we watch it, Jay. It was about. Well, I, I figured we watched it probably three minutes. Yeah. The whole time watching it walk away. But uh, one of the strangest things, you know, I guess I can actually tell this because I've heard some strange stories tonight. So um, <laughs> you'll fit right in. I'll, I'll fit right in. But. Um, we were going over that's that was our goal was to go to fish lake and uh, do some fishing and uh, when we got on top i i took my camera out of my pack and i was going to take some pictures of of the uh, the scenery 
and I actually had a camera in my hand <coughs> when we when we seen the creature, but I couldn't take a picture. And uh, to this day, it haunts me because, uh, well, once it disappeared, then whatever passed over me passed over. I says, Jay, I says. Well, we can get rich, man. Let's head down there. <laughs> so you know, we we took off and chased it down there. But uh, but at the time, I could not take a picture, which was uh, quite a strange thing. Another interesting thing. Uh, I remember David and some of the boys start yelling down at the creature as it was walking away, and they yelling, "What are you? Who are you?" <laughs> the creature stopped, and he got very cautious. And then he started sneaking away, and he started sneaking through the timber, and it was scattered timber, so we could see him here, and then we'd see him there, and then we'd see him in there again. And then he walked through a little opening, come to an opening, and he stood there, and he looked around to see where we were. He didn't probably know we were up on the ridge looking down on him. And uh, then he cautiously went through it, and then he walked over and stood by a pine tree, and he stood there for about a whole minute before he decided to walk disappear in the thicker timber. What kind of color did he <coughs> You want to tell him? I would, No. Uh, he was uh, real dark in color except for his, uh, it was from his shoulders to his waist and it was, uh, it was real white. It was like an old, an old grizzly bear or something like that. Uh, how, how big? Is there an estimate? Oh, okay, uh, Larry, says uh, to me, he says, we can get rich if we get the picture of this guy. So I says, what good's it going to do us if we're both dead? <laughs> and so he, he talked me into it. He says, let's leave the boys on the ridge. They know the way back to the truck. We'll go down and sneak up on this thing and take his picture. So we go down there, and we're standing right there where we first saw him, and we can see some tracks there in the ground. And uh, my son, Brent, who uh, says, Dad, he says, you look like you was about one inch tall down there when I was looking down at you. But he says, the thing we saw was an inch and a half tall. So I'm almost six feet tall, so it was up around nine feet tall. And one thing that really impressed me, too, is I kept saying to Larry, I said, where's the head on this thing? I mean... It, it just looked like it was so big and huge and its shoulders were so broad and its whole body was just massive. And uh, I've seen bears before. In fact, I was in the U.N. was just Saturday and I saw about a 500-pound black bear. And, it, and uh, this thing was much bigger than that 500-pound black bear I just saw. And uh, it walked upright and as it went down around the pond there, why well, you could see the arms swinging and the space between the legs and as it walked away. It was just amazing. We were just, I think Larry was in shock why he didn't take a picture. I think we all were in shock. What are we looking at? Well, I really wasn't in shock. It was kind of a uh, interesting phenomenon, I would say, because uh, it, was, it was like something came over me and said, hey, don't, don't worry about it. It's nothing. It's... You know, I mean, if it was a bear or something like that, I mean, you'd be excited, but I was not excited. Mm. It, uh, it was just real calm, and it was, uh, it was a feeling not to worry about it. And, and then uh, my boy says, take a picture, and I said, oh, I don't know. I've only got a few pictures left, and I thought, I'll, you know, I'll, I'll use it when we go fishing, you know, down there. So, so I didn't take a picture. But. There's, there's still more to this story, though. Uh, so after Larry and I go down there, we, we walk in approximately the same area that it is, and we're tracking it, and I find some markings, scuff marks on the ground, and we go over right through the tree where this creature was standing, and we looked at each other, and we both chickened out right there. We, we're not going to go get his picture, let's just go out of here. So. So then we climb back to the ridge and we get the boys and we go off fishing. And we go on down to Fish Lake and Fish Lake is a fabulous lake. We were catching them right and left. The next thing I know, the sun's going over the mountain. And so, oh no, I'm not going to walk back in the dark. <laughs> and uh, so 
my boys and I, we stayed there by Fish Lake all night with a big bonfire, no sleeping bag, no tent, anything. That was the longest night I ever spent around the lake with a bonfire trying to stay warm. In the meantime, Larry, he, he was a little smarter. He took off and headed back to the Cooper Lakes, and I think he has an experience that you may want to tell. Yeah. Uh, this is what, where Dave comes in, uh, my son Dave. Uh, Dave, why don't you go ahead and tell them about this story? <laughs> it's kind of a hard one to start with. Um, like I say, I was, I was five years old, and um, I was talking to uh, Bob Sanders, who I just happened to know for about a year now. I was talking to him after he told his story, and I had no idea that Bob had had an experience, and he had no idea that I had had an experience. And um, it's kind of funny how you keep it all in, and you don't you don't talk about it a lot. <clears throat> but uh, so that afternoon after fishing, like it was just an amazing day of fishing. And you know what I told Bob is at five years old, I don't remember a lot, but that day I remember every detail. I can remember the smell in the air, the clouds in the sky. I can remember everything about it. I can almost picture the clothing that everybody was wearing, and. Uh, it just is burned in, in my, my memory that day, almost everything about it. So that afternoon, we, we headed back a little bit early, Dad and, and, and us boys. And there's another uh, neighborhood kid with us, uh, Paul Carling, which um, unfortunately, Paul passed a couple years ago. He wasn't able to kind of experience this with us. But uh, we headed back over to the Kubrin where, where we had set up camp the, the night before. And that's kind of where we always based out of and where we would, we would hike up over the ridge line. Well, as we get back and we were, we had cooked dinner and it's getting dark and and uh, as as it got dark, darker and darker, we started hearing the timber breaking, like you've heard in a couple other stories, and we heard a few things and and uh, we smelt that smell that that everybody talks about that just that it, it's a putrid smell that is is truly indescribable. I've never smelt anything like it in all my life, and. Uh, we, we heard the scream a few, this, I'm covering hours here and I apologize, but we heard the scream numerous times that night. Um, we, we heard the timber breaking on, on all sides of the camp. And um, I remember there wasn't a whole lot of chit chat in, in camp that night. You know, we did have the fire and I think everybody was real, it was kind of a, a scary, just kind of a morbid feeling there. Wolves, we, we, we all crawled into bed. <clears throat> Paul Carlene, was on my right side. There's three of us in the tent. I was in the middle. And my oldest brother Scott was on my. Uh, he was on my right. Paul was on my left. My oldest brother Scott was on the right. And uh, I think we were all all pretty scared. And um, nobody knew really knew what to think. And uh, just shortly after we went to bed, we started uh, hearing things like hitting against our tent. Um, little pieces of wood. Then you'd hear a larger piece of wood, kind of kind of fall down next to the tent like somebody was throwing a log um, or, or a large stick near, near the tent. And uh, so we were pretty scared. And I remember at one point, Paul Carling pulled out, if you all know those glow sticks that you crack and you shake up and they keep, give you a little bit of light. You know, we're middle of nowhere and he's got this little thing <laughs> and uh, we all kind of started fumbling over trying to, trying to get it because I think that was our only source of comfort. And at some point during that, I ended up with it and I, I stuck it down my pants so I could keep it. No, nobody else wanted it after that. And thankfully I had it because that was my source of comfort throughout the night. Because shortly right after that is when, when it really got crazy. Um, nobody was really saying much and we were all trying to kind of put the day behind us, I think, and going to sleep. And when we heard the, uh, you know, the branches, then pretty soon we heard the heavy breathing and the... Uh, kind of the, the scratching sounds that you've heard described. I mean, it's really very similar. I, I've had chills down my spine tonight a few times hearing it from other people because it's, it brings back a lot of crazy memories. But at, at one point, whatever it was came over and actually kind of started filling the tent. And, and then, as if that's not bad enough, it laid down and put, I, I'm assuming it's its back against the tent. And it's so large, if you can think of, Jay described a 500 pound bear, well this had to have been three or four times that size, so I can imagine the, the girth or the width of the shoulders that were leaning against that tent, well it all but collapsed it. And it was pretty much laying on top of Paul Carling. And that's 
Well, I really wish he was here to tell his side of that story because I've never heard anything like that. The heat that was coming off of, uh, uh, off of it and it laying on top of him combined with the smell and all three of us in there not daring to even blink. And this thing literally laid on him for what seemed like forever. It uh, had to have been an hour or two. It, we didn't move all night. Nobody said a word. Nobody breathed. And um, at some point in the night, I had finally, I guess, passed out in fear and actually slept a little bit. Um, at some point, it got up and left. And that next morning at light, as, as we all got up and, and kind of examined you could just see them I mean, there there's prints and the, the scuff marks and the wood that had thrown and where the, the tent was just absolutely in ruins where it had had laid on top of him and um, it was quite an interesting experience um, you know and I, dad could probably tell me a little bit more but I don't remember us talking a whole lot about it at that time as we were packing because we got up and we packed up camp and we, you know we were, we were trying to get out of there um, we did talk about it quite a bit later, but it took us a little bit. Yeah, it was like uh, when, when you woke up and you said, hey, or someone says, Bigfoot laid on us all night. And I went, <laughs> yeah, right. <laughs> I said, let's get out of here. And so we packed up and, and got out of there. One, one other thing I might say, I, w I was working for the Standard Examiner at the time, and I knew Bert uh, Strand. He was the outdoor editor, and I came in and I told him about the experience with Bigfoot. And uh, so he printed it, and it was in the Standard Examiner, and it caused a lot of stir. We never did mention the part about the Bigfoot coming and leaning against Paul Carling in the tent, because we thought, my word, people are never going to believe that. I mean, it's bad enough telling them that eight people saw Bigfoot. But uh, that never got in the paper. You're hearing the first time now what happened to... David here and Paul and the other boy. They would have had the, uh, they would have had the, uh, what was the agency that come takes your kids away when you're goofball? <laughs> <laughs> they would have had that done. Yeah. That's tremendous. Uh, talk to us about the fish farm. Uh, I also owned the Cold Springs Trout Farm at the time. And uh, I, after I experienced Bigfoot, I uh, I had spent a lot of time up in the U.N.S. trying to prove that we had seen Bigfoot. I went up there at numerous times. I did hear a real loud jabbering or chattering and a high-pitched scream. And I went over with another friend and we found 80-inch tracks of a small one. And uh, that was in the, the year after that. And then. In uh, 1980, when the two that came down the South Weaver, I think one of the smaller ones, they got separated. The smaller Bigfoot came to North Ogden, and uh, it likes fish. And it decided to visit the fish farm, and I went down one day to feed the fish, and I looked, and there's about 20 or 30 fish laying all over the lawn. And I thought, what? Some teenagers came in last night, but then we got looking closer and we found some big tracks right there by the pond. And it was in April, around the end of April, and it had been raining a lot. The creature had come over to the pond and sunk in the ground and he actually sunk his toes right straight down. I have a cast of him. He's 14 inches long. And it's a good cast. It shows the toe, all five toes, and even the toenail on one of the toes. And uh, he uh, he took fish, and uh, then he left. And I thought, well, I'm going to try and find out how this guy got into the fish farm. So I went out and circled around. There was a little road coming down from Mountain Road down to the, there at the time, and I found tracks of where he'd walked in. I never did find the tracks where he walked out, but the tracks were walking in, I had to stretch my stride just as far as I could to meet his natural walk where he came down in the fish farm. It caused a stir. We got uh, the North Island Place, we got the Fish and Game. Uh, Ralph Plotter of the Fish and Game came. He was the one that actually poured the cast of the footprint. 
And uh, it took me about two years to finally get the cast back from the fish and game. They wanted to keep it as long as they could. But I said, it's, it's on the right place, I want it back, so I've got it now. And uh, there was a lot going on in North Ogden at that time. Um, I don't know if you already mentioned the one, the young man that almost yeah, shot it. Yeah, do that. I have a good neighbor. He doesn't want his name told who he is, but he was living in North Ogden. He had a sow pig with a bunch of piglets, and something came in and took one of the piglets and it was disappeared. So he went out there and he brushed all around the pig pen, going to find out what kind, what was coming in and getting these pigs. It was right towards evening, about dark, and Sal started making a ruckus, and uh, his wife heard it, and she yelled to him, and he happened to have his gun right handy at the back door. He grabbed the 30 out 6 ran out of the back door of the house, and there was Bigfoot standing with the, one of the weeder pigs in his hand. He uh, threw the gun up, put the sight right on his chest, and as he did, the Bigfoot looked startled. He looked at him like, oh brother, I'm in trouble. And this guy pulled the trigger, and the bullet didn't go off. And the Bigfoot ran off and went up Coldwater Canyon with the pig. Uh, he took the same bullet, put it back in his gun the next day, pulled the trigger, and the same shell went off this time. So. Bigfoot apparently can't be killed. <laughs> and he likes pork and he likes fish. <laughs> it's all Let me ask a question. Uh, in uh, see, So this would have been uh, nearly 30 years ago, 20, 30 years ago. 33 years ago. Once, 33 years ago, what's happened in your mind? What's, what is your thinking been changed toward Bigfoot? And I'll have, I'll have each of you answer that in your, what you think. You want me to tell you what I think he is? Well, no, well, just what you think of him. What I think of him? Yeah. Well, I think he's quite intelligent. I think he's curious. He likes to check things out. Uh, apparently, he likes to scare people. Uh, I kind of nicknamed this one, come to fish for him, the teenager. He likes to mess around and fool around, I think. So... <laughs> uh, I don't know. It's a mystery. Uh, all I know is he exists. He, he eats and he walks around and leaves footprints and he's got hair all over him. Okay. Larry? Um, my thoughts on, on Bigfoot uh, is that the truth about Bigfoot is that he does exist. Um, you know, what, it, what he is, what he does, how he lives, I have no idea. Um, but Jay and I and my, our sons and our, you know, we could actually, we could probably go on for another two to three hours and tell you more stories. We've had some real, real experiences that we, we just haven't even had the chance to talk about tonight. Uh, for myself, I, I kind of have shied away from it a lot, um, and talking about it and, uh, you know, because a lot of people you talk to seem to have negative responses uh, towards you. And I really wasn't going to do this show, but Miriam, Jay's wife, chastised me and says, uh, you, know, you, you know, this is something you, you have seen and uh, you know, there's no reason for you not to tell your story because it's true. And so... You know, it's just a, it's a mystery, and it's it's been fun. I I would guess to have had the experience of of seeing something like that. Dave, do you want to go ahead? I think um, for myself, it's it's hard because uh, there's only so many times in your life you can be called a liar, and um, <clears throat> excuse me. So that was always a. Uh, a, a hard one for me, and I know my brothers, and I think as well as Jay's children, we were all you know close friends. You know, growing up, you know, once the story got out, um, you, you kind of shy away from telling it. As a matter of fact, I wasn't planning on on this tonight. I was just a spectator, and they they decided to uh, to drag me up here, and um, I was definitely hesitant. But to me, I mean, there's there's no doubt in my mind of his existence and and, and what I saw. 
And um, as I was talking to a, a gentleman earlier, you know, it, somewhere deep down in, in my heart, and I've told my wife this too, I, I feel as though I'm going to see him again. I don't know how to explain it. I don't know how, why I feel that way. Maybe it's just a crazy curiosity, but um, there's, you know, I know I know of a few people that have seen him more than once, and uh, uh, I don't know. Maybe maybe I'm just just hoping, but uh, yeah, there's there's no doubting what I saw and in, in his existence, and uh, I don't know. That's good. How do you like that? I'll tell you what. The, uh, uh, I've seen the uh, cast, the, the foot cast, and uh, it's so interesting because the toes can go down farther than uh, our own toes, they, almost like a hand. So when he, he stepped out of that pond, it was like that. But the toes look very human. Uh, it's amazing. And the way, the way they got the cast, because he was in, in some uh, soft ground, uh, he actually even has a little bit of the top of a toe that uh, is uh, very clear, uh, uh, just amazing. Uh, I, I want to, uh, do we have Cindy, is she out there? Let's give them another round of applause here and let's bring Cindy out. Thank you, you guys, thank you very much. This story is awesome. We've just kind of gone like this, man. I'll tell you what, I don't know about you guys, but uh, these are, this has been a great night. And it's the best redneck night you could ever have. Yeah, I'll tell you what. It's great. I, I feel bad that I got my back to you people. I hope that's okay. Uh, I, and it, it's this Cindy, as you know, now my daughter was here and she, she uh, uh, was involved in that experience. But Cindy's experience, this is the first time I've heard Cindy's experience. And uh, kind of fill us in a little bit and then uh, tell us. Okay. Um, when Jay was talking about the fish farm, my husband and I lived in a trader home on the fish farm. And to just briefly before my experience happened, when they got the, f when they got the cast by the fish pond, um, my dad came down to see it, and my dad weighed maybe 240. He wasn't a lightweight, he wasn't real big, but the dirt, the mud that that cast was in, the footprint was in his clay. And I remember my dad jumping on that clay right by the footprint, and he didn't even make a dent. There was not even a trace of his footprint in that the next day. So just to let you know, it wasn't just soft mud. Um, during that summer of 1980, uh, before my experience, my mother and my two brothers and my cousin were outside late at night, and they could smell this really putrid, awful smell. And, you know, they're just like, ooh, what is it? That just smells terrible. And pretty soon they heard this scream, and it started out really, really low, and it went higher and higher and higher until it was like a high-pitched woman's scream. And it lasted quite a while, and there was no breath. It was just really long, and it was loud. She described it as like an elephant was across the street. It was really, really powerful. And it came out of the Coldwater Canyon above her house. So I was kind of feeling bad because I didn't get to hear the scream or smell the rotten smell. Um, but as Robert and Jay planned a fishing trip, they went back up into the Uintas to go fishing later in the summer. And I was home with three little kids, and I didn't like being home alone. But Robert liked to go fishing, and he'd go to the UNs every year, so I just handled it. Well, in the middle of the night, Autumn got up and needed a bottle, and she was crying and crying. And so I thought, okay, I've got to get up and make this baby a bottle. So I went in the kitchen and flipped the light on and made this bottle, and I turned around. And in the kitchen window, there were eyes looking back at me through the window. And I knew they were animal eyes because they reflected the light from my kitchen light. And I remember standing there looking at these eyes that were looking directly at me, and they were big eyes. They weren't little. 
And it was just kind of a chilling feeling. But I kept telling myself, turn out the light, go to bed. It's just a cat. Just go to bed. And I remember just standing there and staring at it. And I reached out and turned off the light. And I went back in the bedroom and fed the baby and put her to bed. And I laid there. And it was really, really hard to sleep. It was hard to sleep not having Robert there anyway. And the next morning, I got up and I went outside and I opened the door and I looked where that thing had stood. And our trailer stood two and a half feet off the ground. So my feet were two and a half feet off the ground where that thing stood. And I was looking eye to eye with it. And I knew at that time that was no cat. <laughs> <laughs> and of course my brothers are saying why didn't you open the door and look at it and I says do you not watch the horror movies where they open the door and something yanks them out and eats them you know I says I was not opening the door um, but I have I'll, no I'll tell you what Cindy if, if I had two eyes looking at me from seven feet off the ground I would have run I would have called my wife and said you bring the baby home I'm gone <laughs> Well, and the night before, um, the day before the guys left, they had, um, I believe it was my husband, they had seen some footprints up the, the road above our trailer. And my mom had said, don't tell Cindy. She's going to be terrified when you're gone if you tell her you saw those. And Robert's like, well, they weren't really clear. I couldn't tell if that's really what it was. They're just, they're just footprints. It could have been a dog or something. And so when he got home and he was thinking, when he was up, fishing that maybe they might see him that I had a really close encounter and um, I would say they were they were big and maybe the size of a human's eyes so wow. how do you like that story yeah thank you so much thank you thank you for coming yeah that's that's one thing you don't want to have happen and uh, yeah yeah D Dave's having a hard time with the eyes what color were they they were a goldish red color, and if I had to put my hands apart, you know, look, thinking back, they were about like this far apart. So, and they were pretty big. That's great. Give her a big hand. I don't think she knew she was coming up until right then. Well, I'm glad that women now know that uh, Bigfoot could possibly I'm sure you had that experience <laughs> exist. And um, the thing about it is, there's people in this audience, we have a whole group here that are, that could do stories, and, ex and I don't want to say stories, experiences that uh, just are spectacular. Now, there's people uh, that have got way more stuff. There's some great guys up here, and if you'd like to visit, and I think we'll shut it down now so that you can visit with them. And thank you, and good night from Dave Bigfoot Show. <laughs> good work. <laughs>